In the heart of Africa is a small mountainous country that stands at the divide between Central and East Africa. A country of astonishing natural beauty and biodiversity. But one where the past contains great sadness. From brutal European colonization, to land degradation, to the horrific genocide in 1994, the people have had much to endure. Now, Rwanda is modernizing, at a time when many of its neighbors in East Africa are facing the threat of famine, and the world has recognized that human impact is negatively affecting the Earth's climate. We believe that the responsibility of each nation to find the best ways to adapt, to adjust, to find solutions that uh, uh, don't compromise the sustainable development we are looking for, for why too. And this is what we chose as Rwanda as we decided to, uh, to elaborate the, the, our national strategy on climate change and low carbon development. So we assessed the economic impact of this climate change and we came up with figures. And those figures were so, so instructive, so helpful for policymakers. And from this assessment, we, we decided we cannot wait. This is why you have been developing this uh, climate change, this strategy for climate change adaptation and low carbon growth of Rwanda. Challenged by climate variability, extreme weather events, dependency on imported oil, population growth, and regional food shortages, nevertheless, Rwanda is emerging. The country is developing its institutional base and legal frameworks, and the economy is growing at one of the fastest rates in the world. We've come to Rwanda to observe as this country develops its national strategy, and to document the steps the government and the people of Rwanda are employing to move beyond the tragedies of the past, to simultaneously develop the economy, and address the challenges of climate change. The 20th century for Rwanda was a very tough time. When European colonization ended, it left a very damaged society. The suffering culminated in the brutal genocide of 1994. This awful legacy reset the clock in Rwanda. Now, a new generation of Rwandans is striving to put the past behind them and build their common future. In a notable process, various Rwandan government ministries collectively expressed an integrated vision of how the country can continue to grow its economy while simultaneously strengthening its resilience to climatic and economic shocks. Among the lowest per capita emitters of greenhouse gases in the world, Rwandans clearly can't be blamed for causing climate change. But like everyone else on Earth, they're vulnerable. National meteorological data show that temperatures in Rwanda have been rising at a higher rate than global averages. In a series of far-reaching decisions, Rwanda has connected its development together with restoring its ecology and increasing resilience to climate change. For the vast majority of Rwandans, this means replacing destructive traditional agricultural techniques with more sustainable methods, and for some, leaving agriculture altogether. Although Rwanda has traditionally been blessed with abundant rainfall and fertile volcanic soils, it also has one of the highest population densities in the world. This puts enormous pressure on scarce land resources. Look at what happens in Africa. Desertification is increasing, mostly because people are really scrambling for what, whatever possibility there is to produce food, inclu inc including 
going into lands that we shouldn't be going into. We are going into marginal areas that we shouldn't be going into because people need food. The mountainous topography and the large number of small farmers demanding land has led to deforestation and farming on the steep slopes. Through painful experience, Rwanda has recognized that its development is dependent on functioning ecosystems. And the country has begun implementing nationwide land use reform. This has meant terracing the hillsides to create more sustainable fields for the farmers and planting a very large number of trees. Up here, you can have more than 60% slope. And this land has been put in forest land. And the people from here have been located to Rubavu side. Rwandan tea is one of the country's biggest export crops. Josepha works in one of the largest tea plantations. It's a pretty hard life. <laughs> Reform in Rwanda has also included institutional development and the strengthening of legal rights. There are two major undertakings that we have within our institution. One which was the development of the National Land Use Master Plan. The other major program is the land registration program. We also believe that uh, with the registration of land, people get security of tenure. From the results we've got from the pilot, there's a positive indication that with secure tenure, people are able to invest more and care better for their land. We are giving ourselves maybe three years of growth so that by 2020, we have 30% of actually forested area. So there's now really an aggressive campaign across the country to restore destroyed forests. Rwanda forestation and uh, large-scale ecosystem restoration is a, a response to the implementation of this strategy. We would like to be to adapt, but we want also to be to mitigate. So by increasing our forest cover, we are recovering the ecological functions. So this is where this initiative is a response to what you have planned to the strategy already in place. The reforms have now been going on for several years, and there have been results. There has been a lot of restoration that has been carried out uh, relating to our environment. And we've seen that restoration grow from here to another year. Rwanda would be one case where you can see very live examples of changes that have happened within a short period of time. I always refer to a district just near by here, Bugesera district, which 10 years ago was semi-arid, but today it's becoming one of the bread baskets for, for, for the country. And it's in complete contrast to just across the border in Burundi, uh, these are just the same. Uh, these are two areas that used to suffer from famine year in, year out. But with afforestation, the microclimate of Jesera has changed. People are growing crops and people come to actually uh, get food from across the border. But in order to ensure that the land won't be degraded again, the causes of the degradation must be addressed. 
Approximately 80% of the Rwandan people make their living as small farmers or farm workers. The primary source of energy for them has been firewood or charcoal, and this has traditionally contributed to deforestation. Transitioning away from burning biomass to a cleaner and more sustainable energy source is central to Rwanda's future. How do we provide energy for 11 million people today and probably 25 million people by mid-century? How do we provide that in a small landlocked country that, in a way that's not dependent on oil? Remarkably, as complex as this seems, within Rwanda are a number of innovative ideas. The vast majority of Rwandans are still not connected to the national electrical grid, and the cost to connect small mountain villages can be prohibitive. This suggests that distributed energy production could be an answer. One such technology is local production of biogas. Justin and Chantel are very glad their family can participate in early adoption. Another distributed energy source that benefits from Rwanda's unique geographical characteristics is micro hydropower. Not everyone in Rwanda is a subsistence farmer, and more and more young people are getting an education, and more and more people are expected to move into non-agricultural livelihoods and into the city. I work as a research officer and um, it is research activities actually within the department of research, planning and project development. Kigali is the capital city of Rwanda and if you haven't been paying attention to what's happening there, you might be surprised. There'll be no vehicular traffic allowed within the area. It will remain a strictly pedestrian area, pedestrian zone, so that it's friendly for pedestrians, easy for shopping, and it's more retail shopping than wholesale shopping. Considering where the country is coming from, this type of planning reflects an extraordinary level of vision. But given the growth projections, it may be required. The city of Kigali today is one million people, the population. By mid-century, it's going to be around five million people. We today have the opportunity to manage that expansion of the population in a way that focuses down on sustainability from its very beginning. In this uh, 10 hectares, we are developing plots of an average of about 4,000 square meters. And on these 4,000 square meters, we are developing uh, mixed-use uh, developments, 
but mainly commercial and retail, and then uh, with a touch of probably slightly high-end um, residential housing, so that it complements uh, the central business district. The marshland is also going to be redeveloped or revitalized. So if there's any construction or any development that is done, there are certain buffer areas that we have to provide. We also had a project here that uh, conducted some biodiversity assessments on specific ecosystems. These were critical ecosystems. And uh, most of these critical ecosystems were mainly marshlands. Rwanda is now on a track of revising its National Biodiversity Strategic and Action Plan which is actually going to guide and try to gather all the activities related to biodiversity conservation. These ambitions require a huge amount of energy and biogas and microhydro won't be enough. Sufficient energy is central to Rwanda's development but emissions from fossil fuels are a big factor in human impact on the climate. Solving this dilemma is crucial to finding the path to sustainability. Rwanda is heavily dependent on imported oil. Now, of course, as oil prices continue to rise, as they're bound to do, conventional oil supply is a diminishing quantity now. Prices go up, and countries like Rwanda have their ability to develop well-being for their people massively hit by these rising oil prices. Can a small developing country like Rwanda find enough renewable energy sources to fuel the type of growth they are envisioning? Again, many may find the answers surprising. Just outside Kigali is one of the largest solar arrays of its kind in sub-Saharan Africa. We're about 400 meters above Kigali city, eight kilometers away. We have what we call tables of panels, four by eight panels, 40 of them, and we have a hundred of these tables. They are pretty advantages for an area like this because they work really well when they're hot and they work also really well when they are, when we have a bit of a diffused light. I've been here for seven years and the power situation has improved a lot. To the west of the country is Lake Kivu, and within this lake is an enormous resource, naturally occurring methane. The target was to show the world we have the methane gas in this lake and we can produce electricity by this methane gas and we succeed. It was planned to produce four megawatts. We continue to improve our technology just to reach uh, more than four megawatts, maybe 50 megawatts in the future. Rwanda is also well positioned to use relatively large-scale hydropower to feed its central grid. And that's not all. Biogas, mini hydro, solar, natural methane deposits, and large hydro are all part of a compelling sustainable energy mix. But as important as these options are, the really big opportunity for Rwanda may be something entirely different. Geothermal energy. We intend to drill three geothermal wells. If they are successful, then we are going to build a, a power plant of 10 megawatts as a proof of concept to, to use to attract foreign investment and private sector participation in the power sector in Rwanda in geothermal development. We hope to, to, to generate up to 300 megawatts of uh, power from geothermal resources. This is within the next seven years. If Rwanda can solve the energy conundrum and free itself from the petroleum economy, then it will have achieved something that many developed countries have so far been unable to accomplish. And perhaps its other ambitious plans are not impossible. We can design Kigali now in a way that optimizes development into the future. I think that's the key. Leapfrog into a sustainable future rather than going through the painful development process that we in the developed world went through. To help themselves to control their destiny, they're crunching the numbers. 
we measure so many things, economic and social. Economic indicators, we have things like inflation, we can see food prices, we can see non-food prices, we can see economic growth. In the social context, we measure everything from living conditions, we measure poverty, we measure household uh, characteristics, housing, we, we measure what energy is used. Rwanda does not exist in isolation. It is surrounded by many neighbors, all of them larger than Rwanda. Anything that happens in the neighboring countries affect us directly. For example, if uh, we have poor harvests in the neighboring countries because of droughts, it affects us directly. We see our production going to those countries and uh, where we thought we had enough, it's not enough anymore. Something certainly seems different about Rwandan politics. And it might have something to do with the fact that there are more women in government in Rwanda than anywhere else in the world. Rwanda's renaissance seems to be unleashing a pent-up creativity, and it's difficult not to be impressed if you witness it. This country represents a tiny microcosm of the vast continent of Africa, but it is providing a glimpse of what is possible. <laughs> It is important, uh, I think, for the country uh, to move on the low carbon path. Kigali City is uh, being awarded the UN Habitat Scroll of Honor Award, which uh, was awarded to a, an African country for the first time. Rwanda is developing at a time when the world is facing great ecological and economic uncertainty. It is hard to look to the developed world for guidance when they are reeling from crisis to crisis. This makes Rwanda's reasoned and proactive development strategy even more noteworthy. The world should be sustainable to everybody. I have hope that people sometime will come to their senses and they realize that equity is the best solution. By studying the science of climate change and proactively developing a national strategy, Rwanda is providing an example of how a developing country can make its environment more resilient and stimulate its economy by mitigating and adapting to climate change. Is a common interest. We may be different in terms of levels of prosperity and, and all kinds of things, but in the end, the interest to reverse or to prevent the damage caused by climate change uh, should uh, bring us together. And, and uh, together we can really do a lot. Not everything in Rwanda works. There is a long way to go, and the shadow of recent history tempers any possibility of exaltation. But Rwanda is challenging preconceptions, assumptions, and prejudice. As individual smallholders, they have no hope of accessing markets at all. So we took up the policy of land conservation to ensure that. And we've been successful at that. It, we started it four years ago, and we have, we, we as Rwanda now, today we are very proud to say we are food secure. I think we can all have hope, yes. Out of this uh, disaster is emerging a quite remarkable society. We want to see uh, international cooperation on climate change become effective. Uh, we are set to tap the opportunities that are there in terms of uh, uh, increase, increasing our adaptive capacity. We have, we have established a fund, an Environment and Climate Change Fund, which is going to, we hope, help us to mobilize resources and to make sure that the strategy is implemented. Preserving our environment, managing properly issues relating to climate change is really everybody's business. It should involve everybody.
if it works here in Rwanda, it can work anywhere else.